can I just take this moment to thank each and every one of you amazing supporters. This channel has grown into an amazing community of story lovers. I could not have done it without you guys. If you haven't yet subscribed, then please be part of this journey and help us reach new heights. Thank you. My date with Rebecca started out fun enough. We grabbed some drive through parked near the old industrial complex and started exploring the creepy abandoned buildings as a random adventure on this warm summer night. We were laughing at first, daring each other to crawl through busted windows and sneak down moldy hallways in the dark. But things took a seriously freaky turn once we stumbled upon those first strange symbols smeared on a crumbling wall. Initially, I figured it was just some edgy graffiti left behind by vandals. But as Rebecca's flashlight illuminated more of the extensive writings and crude drawings, an ominous feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. This was more than just random tagging. Strange spiraling shapes and cryptic writing covered almost every inch of the walls, floor, and even parts of the ceiling. We ventured deeper, moving slowly through debris strewn rooms with crumbling walls. I started to make up disturbing details that gave me pause. Drawing of something that appeared frighteningly like a human heart. More of those spiral designs framing odd letters that didn't seem to spell out any actual words. Stick figure drawings of bodies contorted in what looked like pain. Or were they dancing? Odd smudges that my overactive imagination conjured into bloodstains. Things got even creepier when we entered a larger room and swept our flashlights around. My breath caught as the light glinted off definite animal bones and shards of broken mirrors carefully arranged in weird circular patterns across parts of the grimy floor. Scraps of fabric that may have once been robes or curtains lay shredded and bunched in certain areas alongside stubs of burned down candles and piles of ashes. My heart quickened as my brain connected the dots, were those makeshift altars. My skin prickled with goosebumps despite the warm evening. I could tell Rebecca felt it too from the look on her face as we scanned the beam of our flashlights over more bizarre details that seemed to suggest occult rituals or offerings. The vibe was not good. At all. As we crept toward the back of the room, an even more chilling sight emerged from the shadows. A larger symbol had been scorched into the crumbling drywall, with more odd writing and drawings radiating out from it. My throat tightened when I realized the central design was an inverted pentagram. I might fail an ancient symbology class, but even I knew that particular shape carried bad vibes and dark histories. Exchanging an uneasy glance with Rebecca, I could tell we were both completely on edge now. The implications here were clear. Someone was very actively using this crumbling building for intensely shady and disturbing purposes on the regular. As the beam of my flashlight caught the glint of an old rusted knife tucked into a worn crevice, a cold wave of understanding sank into my churning gut. We needed to get out of here right now grabbed Rebecca's clammy hand and headed swiftly toward where I thought the exit was as she whispered what kind of absolute freaks are hanging out here. I shook my head and picked up speed, stumbling over fallen beams and holes in the warped floor. The weak light from our dying flashlights caught only glimpses of more symbols, altars, and suspicious stains as we rushed through room after room. I didn't want to see any more. My heart pounded louder with every step, limbs tingling with adrenaline. Finally, we burst out of a sagging metal side door into muggy fresh air. Gasping with relief, we raced shackily toward my truck and quickly locked ourselves inside as I jammed the ignition to life. Peeling out down the dirt road, I checked a rearview mirror compulsively for any followers. Rebecca too kept nervously looking behind us and then over at me with wide, anxious eyes as she babbled out about demonic rituals and psycho axe murderers. My nerves felt completely frayed by the time I pulled up to drop Rebecca off wanting desperately to just go home. But as she got out, she turned and squeezed my clammy hand warmly. Well, that was definitely a memorable first date, Wyatt. I huffed a weak laugh in response to seeing those eerie symbols every time I blinked. We agreed to meet up again soon, preferably somewhere significantly less likely to give me lasting nightmares. Driving home, I kept going over it all in my head. Who uses a nasty abandoned building for such freaky purposes and leaves such creepy evidence just lying around? I mean, those walls and makeshift altars looked recently used and added to. Nervous tinge went through me imagining rope figures chanting ominously by candlelight, reflecting in shards of broken glass and rusted blades. What kind of absolute freaks indeed? 
I resolved right then to anonymously report the location to the police in the morning just so it's on their radar. As I pulled into my driveway, relief flooded me at the sight of home. I'm definitely sticking to normal date spots like mini golf from now on. No more checking out creepy locations on a win after dark. That's for sure. I can't erase the mental image of that recent activity, and I won't be venturing anywhere near that godforsaken building ever again. Time for a scalding shower and mindless cartoons to try vainly soothing my still seriously rattled nerves after that way too real nightmare fodder. Lesson learned, abandoned places with strange writings equal nope. I was pumped for my big date with Kai at Hush, this exclusive underground club I'd heard endless buzz about. Apparently you can't even get in unless you're dressed to impress and know the secret password they change weekly. Luckily Kai had an invite hookup through his model friends. I wore my tightest little black dress and highest heels going for sexy mysterious vibes perfect for a spot literally located in a converted basement speakeasy from the 1920s. First, everything seemed impossibly glamorous, with guests sipping fancy cocktails and dancing to ambient house music under glowing neon lights. Everyone looked unfairly gorgeous, even in the hazy darkness. Kai and I definitely didn't stand out from the stylishly dressed crowd filling every table and hip couch area. I have to admit, I felt like a total VIP. But as the night wore on, an undercurrent of something sinister seemed to creep in. The signature cocktail I'd been sipping started to take on strange medicinal undertones I hadn't noticed before. The pulsing beat of the music felt heavier now too, almost aggressive instead of sexy. Had they turned up the volume, glancing around in the dim light, even the models and glitterati seemed grittier now. Lipstick a little too red, smiles a little too forced, eyes glassier than just booze alone should cause. A laugh near me sounded shrill and brittle instead of joyous. Imagining things due to too many pink cocktails. Maybe, but something about the atmosphere seemed subtly yet palpably altered. Leaning in close so Kai could hear me over the music, I asked if we could go somewhere quieter for a bit. He nodded eagerly, eyes on familiar levels of bloodshot. Taking my hand firmly, almost painfully, he led me not upstairs to the exit as expected, but further into the basement depths. My steps faltered, but momentum carried us around a dark corner to an even more dimly lit lounge area. The vibe here felt ominous, faces obscured by shadows and cigarette smoke swirling under sickly green neon beams. The music was muffled, but the bass thrummed loudly through the floor, making my heels vibrate. Exchanging apprehensive looks with Kai, I can tell he felt the creep factor rising too. His usual easy grin looked brittle and sweat glistened at his hairline. We sat gingerly on a dingy velvet sofa that I prayed wasn't hiding bed bugs or worse. Kai made efforts at light banter while I sipped conservatively from a fresh cocktail delivered by a waiter whose eyes were obscured behind dark glasses. Had the staff's uniforms always been that black? The drink's cloyingly sweet flavor now held an unpleasant chemical bite. Around a saloon's shadowy groups, laughter too shrill, expression blank, this whole scene was growing unsettling in a way I couldn't define. I wanted nothing more than the comforting neon glow of the main bar area. We had just resolved silently to head upstairs when a woman nearby roared with sharp laughter, her tipped back head revealing dilated eyes glazed over. The raucous sound terminated abruptly as she appeared to crumple forward almost involuntarily, drink spilling down her dress unheaded. Her male companion remained frozen in place, not moving. Drugged. I met Kai's panicked eyes with my own heart kicking as I hastily stood, just as a deafening crack resounded through the space. Everyone froze, even the music paused. In the sudden silence, two more bangs cracked out, impossibly loud. Then chaos erupted. People began screaming, voices pitched in fear and agony as more ear-splitting bangs rang out accompanied by the sound of shattering glass. Kai yanked me down roughly behind the sofa just as a projectile whizzed past, smashing bottles on the back bar. Crouching low, ears ringing with the ongoing staccato bursts, I dully recognized his gunshots. We scrambled toward a darkened hallway as stampeding bodies rammed past. A fallen woman's extended arm blocked our path, dripping dark liquid I refused to process. Eyes fixed forward, Kai dragged me bodily over it with brute adrenaline force. The narrow concrete corridor echoed screams and pleas for help along with more of those terrifying thunderclaps. Portraits hung askew, their eyes appearing to follow our awkward progress crouched against the wall, broken glass grinding under my hands and knees. Voices turned guttural up ahead, and sounds I didn't want to identify any my stomach have. Merely feet now from a doorway glowing with promise of escape, I blinked sweat from my stinging eyes. 
Suddenly, Kai's urgent grip on my wrist went limp. Ears ringing wildly, trying vainly to block out the unrelenting noise, I turned and wished forever that I hadn't. My painstakingly selected little black dress was now torn and drenched in sticky warmth. Hoping Eckerd air scorched with the aroma of spilled liquor and sooner things, the need to flee eclipsed all else. On pure hysterical adrenaline, I clambered up the metal stairs on my own, bursting out into the muddy alley behind the deceivingly ordinary facade hush hid behind. My feet, bruised and slick with what I knew too well was not spilled cocktails, propelled me blindly away as racing figures shoved past. The chaotic street opened up before me, lurching toward salvation now in the form of neon storefronts promising comforting normalcy. I felt bile and horror rising as unavoidable reality crashed fresh with every rag breath. My shattered mind conjured Kai's last expression, the moment seared into my soul right before vibrant life glowed no more, echoing loudly as the street scene tunneled away into blessed darkness and oblivion on this most fateful night. The night lamer descended fully into terror and hush, the now demonic underground memory haunting me forevermore. Should have let my friend Angie talk me into this. But she swore this guy Greg from her office was really nice and cute. And meeting at Marcello's, this cozy little Italian place seemed harmless enough. When I arrived at the restaurant, a man standing by the hostess station waved politely, tall with curly brown hair and sharp cheekbones. Objectively attractive. I smiled and went over to introduce myself. Brianna? I'm Greg, so nice to meet you. We shook hands as he grinned broadly. His palm felt oddly clammy. We were seated, he made a show of carefully scooting his chair in, navigating with a white cane. Sorry, still getting used to moving around since the accident last year. Ah, Angie forgot to mention he was blind. But no big deal, I thought charitably. We all have baggage. The conversation over salad starters and breadsticks flowed smoothly enough. Rick cracked silly accounting jokes and asked about my job managing social media for a boutique PR firm. When our entrees arrived, though, his questions took an oddly personal turn. How long had I lived downtown, and where exactly did I have roommates? He mentioned loving cats several times until I finally revealed I have two tabbies named Mac and Cheese. Aw, cute names. Greg gushed. I bet they're the perfect cuddle buddies to come home to every night. An image flashed in my mind that I tried to shrug off. Had I ever posted pics of my cats online? Where I can ponder further, he switched topics, asking if I rented or owned my condo. A vague answer, suddenly eager for the check. Trying to steer conversation to safer ground, I asked about his accident. Greg eagerly launched into a story about how exactly he lost his sight in a bizarre Christmas tree decorating incident last December, getting oddly specific on gory details. While distracted trying to saw off a tree branch, he stumbled and fell right onto the running electric handsaw. I sat frozen, fork halfway to my mouth as he described the harrowing pain and rushed ambulance ride, vital fluids everywhere. How does one even respond politely to such an overshare? Mercifully, the waiter returned, inquiring about dessert. I firmly declined, but Greg insisted on splitting the classic tiramisu. The waiter soon returned, bearing one plate with two forks. Figuring I just needed to make it through this final course, I dug in warily. The first creamy, rich bite reminded me why I loved this restaurant. But when I went to spear my second bite, there was nothing on my fork. Lance up to see Greg eating the very last piece, looking sheepish. Whoops, sorry about that. When you can't see it's so hard to remember to share. He grinned as I frowned. Flagging down our waiter to bring another dessert fork seemed ridiculous, so I just sat staring at Greg polishing off the plate, irritation growing. He really couldn't sense how much was still left. Finally, the date from hell seemed to be ending. On the sidewalk outside Marcello's, Greg smiled down at me saying he'd had a wonderful time and would love to do this again soon. Taken aback, I murmured a non-committal thanks while trying unsuccessfully to flag down a cab. An awkward silence stretched until Greg cleared his throat nervously. Hey, can I tell you something crazy? He shifted from foot to foot before continuing in a rush. I feel this deep connection between us, Brianna. Like I've known me forever, we're just so in sync. I know it's wild since we just met, but I actually have kind of been following you on social media for a while now. My breath caught as prickles raced up my neck. Wait, what did he just say? Following me how exactly? Greg continued speaking rapidly. It just really feels like fate brought us together tonight. At first, I only knew basic stuff about you online, 
your cute selfies, food pics, hanging with friends. But over time, as I saw more of your world, you felt so real to me. I could tell you missed such a beautiful heart and soul. And I had this accident taking away my sight, which was so lonely and depressing at first. But then discovering you made me see hope again. Stomach dropping with dawning horror, I stared wordlessly up at his looming shadow while frantically scanning the dark street for a cab to hail, pedestrian to appeal to, manhole to jump down, anything to escape. Oblivious to my panic paralysis, Gray kept rambling delusionally. It's just when everything went dark physically, finding you was this ray of light like I could actually see for the first time. Your post brought your essence to life for me. I know from your stories about mac and cheese you come home exhausted some nights and just need to cuddle with your kitties, unwind with joggers, and take out on the couch. There it was. The glaring confirmation this unassuming blind accountant had constructed some fantasy version of me from random social media posts and conjured up this entire elaborate evening just to insert himself into the world he pieced together. Revulsion seized me as my hand finally landed on the handle of a stuffed cab, wrenching the door open and I dove inside shouting my address through the plexiglass while locking the passenger door with shaking fingers. As we peel away, I glimpsed Greg still standing there looking forward and yet eerily calm. Suppressing the urge to vomit, I crouched low staring fixedly ahead until my building finally appeared. I made it upstairs in a cold sweat, double bolting the door before running to grab my laptop with trembling hands. Sighting in, I frantically combed through privacy settings on all accounts, making my profiles invisible to anyone I wasn't already connected to. Changing passwords for good measure, paranoia surged that Greg or whatever his real name was could somehow be tracking my digital footprint this very second. The extent he'd orchestrated this illusion of connection between us felt violating on a primal level. Who knows what private details he harvested to accomplish this single, unsettling night, swearing off blind dates and lax social media privacy apparently. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.